We are delighted to be joined by Dr. Stephen Nichols, President of Reformation Bible College and Chief Academic Officer of Ligonier Ministries, to talk about his brand new book, R.C. Sproul, A Life. And what a life that was. Hello and welcome to Exposit for Words, Stephen. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, thank you. When you hear the name R.C. Sproul, what are the first things that come to mind? <laughs> well, as you said, uh, what a life, R.C. Sproul. And I think the first thing that comes to mind is sort of larger than life life. Um, he just was one of those figures that is a sort of a, a rare person that comes along in church history with just a unique set of gifts that I believe God just blessed and had at one of those moments in the church where his voice was needed yeah. and God used him to impact the church. And I think the truth is for, for not only us now and immediately after his death, but even for maybe generations to come, uh, we'll see an impact of, um, of RC's ministry uh, in the life of the church. Yeah. Can you remember the first time that you met him? <laughs> I did. Or I do. Yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> the first one was a little bit, interesting. I was a college student at the time. This was back when there were these Philadelphia Conference on Reform Theology. So this goes back into the early 90s. He, is, of course, was there with his good friend, Jim Boyce, and a friend of mine and I, we, we went to the conference. We were in that book signing line, you know, that, that has that long line that would yeah. snake out of the building and down the road. And so finally, it was our turn. And my friend said to him as he as he slid the book across the desk to sign, Dr. Sproul, will, will by any chance uh, you be in New Jersey speaking sometime? And Dr. Sproul looks up at him and says, uh, young man, if I am in New Jersey, it won't be by chance. Uh, and of course, that was just, you know, RC's way of messing with us. <laughs> But then it was, it was years yeah. later, uh, back in 2010, I was invited down here uh, for a small conference here on the campus of Ligonier and St. Andrew's Chapel. And I had dinner, I was supposed to have dinner with the Sprouls. So as you can imagine, I'm cramming, you know, right before the exam, I, br I brought my theological dictionaries with me and I'm, I'm all ready for this intense theological conversation we're going to have. And immediately the Sprouls just you're just at ease in their presence. They ask you about your family and your kids and do you have pets? And of course I mentioned we have a dog and then it's just, you know, off to the races talking yeah. about dogs. Uh, so yeah, just a, just delightful memories of, of times with RC and Vesta. Yeah. How would you describe the legacy of RC bro? I think if you're talking about theology at the center of it, I think is going to be the holiness of God. Um, it really was the hallmark of his ministry. It's part of our mission statement here. We teach, proclaim, and defend the holiness of God in all of its aspects to as many people as possible. I don't really know of many Christian organizations that have the holiness of God in their mission statement. Um, it was David Wells who, who said uh, that the, the um, God rests too casually on the shoulders of the American church. I think we could expand that context to say, you know, even the global church. Yeah. And I think we could even expand that to say on culture. Yeah. And that really was what RC labored for, was, was to have, whether you're in the church or in the culture, to have a proper view of who God is. Uh, so I think at the center of his legacy is going to be his book, his classic book, The Holiness of God, and just that emphasis. Um, I think there were other things he did as well uh, that are going to carry through. And I also think part of his legacy was just his emphasis on lay education. Uh, he, he was a populist uh, in, the, in the sense that the reformers were populists. They took the message to the people, and that's what R.C. did. He, he saw really this sort of barren space of lay education back in the 1970s. And he just went into that. And um, I, I think that that too will be uh, sort of his method, if you will, in addition to his message, uh, will be part of his legacy. Yeah, for sure. How did RC become a Christian? And also what drew him to ministry? 
yeah, he grew up in the church, but it was a liberal church, uh, sang in the choir, went to church all the time, never heard the gospel. Yeah. He's a freshman college student at Westminster College and historically Presbyterian church up about an hour's drive north of Pittsburgh up in Pennsylvania. He's a freshman. He gets summoned over to a table and there are two upper class football stars, really. And R.C. was there on athletic scholarship. So, you know, this is this is a big deal. And so, of course, he's going to go talk to these guys. And they're sitting, you know, in the common area in the dorm and they're hunched over a Bible and they're having a Bible study. Well, R.C. never saw anything like this. You know, it's no context for this. And they have an open Bible and it's, it's open to a verse in Ecclesiastes. If a tree falls in the woods, there it will lie. And uh, R.C. goes on to say, that's probably the only, he's the, probably the only person in church history that was converted by that verse. I'm pretty sure he's right. <laughs> but R.C. said, and this is so R.C., isn't it? He, he said, I, I saw it uh, at, the, at that moment. I was the dead fallen tree just rotting on the ground he goes back to his dorm room and he gets on his knees and he cries out for god to have mercy on him and for god to save him and he's converted i think early on he has a call to the ministry but what you see initially i mean right out of that first moment he's converted is an absolute love for god and his word yeah and he just pours himself into scripture and allows scripture to pour himself into him. And by the end of college, he's ready to go to seminary and wants to pursue a lifetime of, of ministry. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well. God has used R.C. Sproul's ministry to lead many people to know the Lord. What can Christian readers learn from his, his example of evangelism? Hmm. You know, it's interesting you say that. He would call himself not an evangelist, uh, but uh, more of a dis discipleship person. In fact, right after he was converted and he goes back home, uh, he sends a message to a lot of his former friends that he wanted them to gather and he wanted to share his testimony of what just happened to him. And none of them came. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he says, okay, maybe I'm not called to be an evangelist. Um, but, I, but I think what, what we can learn is this. There are three fundamental questions or three fundamental issues that we are talking about when we are talking about the gospel. Who is God? Who am I? And in light of that, who is my substitute? Yeah. So who is God? Well, of course, he's holy. And who am I? I'm a sinner. Uh, it, this, is, this is R.C. He said this all the time. Even the smallest sin is worthy of damnation because even what we would call the smallest sin is cosmic treason, yeah. rebellion against the holy God. So let's not compare ourselves to our neighbor or let's not think we're pretty good. Let's compare ourselves to the standard of God's holiness. So who is God? Who am I? And when we realize that, this is the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter six, woe is me. Yeah. And, and he needs his lips, his unholy lips purged by an external force, right? By an alien force. And so here we are unrighteous and we need an alien outside of us righteousness. And that is our substitute, the God man, Jesus Christ. So that that's the gospel. And that message resonates with people because that's who we truly are. And that's who God is. So yeah. So as you think about sharing the faith and as you think about sharing the gospel, it really does come back to those three things. Yeah. And just in a, in a way of just helping people come to grips with those life or death questions yeah. that, that they must answer. Yeah. You write a lot about Sproul's marriage to his wife, Vesta. In what ways is their marriage an example to other married couples who serve in ministry together? Yeah, it's a great story of faithfulness, isn't it? And how people love to throw into our faces the story of, uh, of unfaithfulness and how they grab the headlines. But here's the, you know, the, I saw this. I knew it because I saw R.C. Investor, but as I did the biography, I, I really got to see it even more. The story of R.C. is a love story. It's a love story between R.C. and Vesta. They met for the first time when he is in the first grade and she is in the second grade. 
they get engaged right at, as RC begins college. They're married before his senior year and she had just graduated. It was a lifetime of true partnership, uh, RC and Vesta. One of the things people probably don't realize is that the third book that RC wrote was a book called Discovering the Intimate Marriage. Um, and uh, it's just a beautiful love story, uh, the love story of RC and Vesta. And I, I think what we have to learn from it is just the, the beauty of faithfulness in marriage. Um, and if you don't know, I, I imagine a lot of people don't know about that book by RC. It's still in print today, The Intimate Marriage. And uh, he puts in there all kinds of stories, you know, about how uh, how he wanted Vesta to buy him a set of golf clubs for Christmas. And when she didn't, he was disappointed. <laughs> so, you know, you, you see the whole picture in there uh, with RC and Vesta. Yeah. Uh, but it, yeah, what a what a testimony of faithfulness. I know you got to spend a lot of time with Vesta and I've heard you speak recently that you've missed not having the opportunity to spend as much time <laughs> when you was doing your research. How, how is Vesta doing today? Yeah, she's doing great. Uh, she's in the office every day. Uh, she's with us for Ligonier events and uh, she's very much involved in the life of the ministry and she's doing very well. She misses him, of course, and she talks about that, but she's, she's of course, so happy for him uh, that he is in heaven and uh, she, she just, she clings to the theology uh, that uh, he taught her yeah. and just rests in a good and sovereign God. Yeah. Sproul had many friends within evangelical circles. How did those relationships further his impact? Yeah, sure. Uh, I had friendships uh, with, we go back to Jim Boyce. I mentioned him. This is James Montgomery Boyce, pastor of 10th Presbyterian Church. They met early on, right when Boyce first got to 10th in the late 60s. Uh, and we're just foxhole buddies through the inerrancy issues of 1970s and part of the Chicago Statement on Inerrancy together. Uh, they were together through, and we'll probably get into this, the Evangelicals and Catholics Together controversy in 1994. Uh, and then I put in the book, because I just had to, the touching letter that R.C. wrote to Jim when R.C. learned of Jim's cancer diagnosis. And it took Jim very quickly. But R.C. wrote a beautiful letter and it, he's sort of teasing Jim in one little moment of it. And then all of a sudden, R.C. just stops and he writes, I love you, Jim. And it's just a, a great insight, I think, for us. You know, we see these platform figures up there, uh, but they, there's genuine friendships. Yeah. There's also the friendship with MacArthur. And this I love because they're so different theologically. Uh, but R.C. called MacArthur Boris. And uh, that goes back to the former premier of the Soviet Union, Boris, who, who was seen often, you know, in a tank going down the streets of Moscow. And so RC would say, that's you, John, you're Boris in the tank. And I remember, you know, John recently just said that, uh, you know, he misses RC for a lot of reasons, but he misses him the most because there's no one around to call him Boris yeah. anymore. <laughs> so those, those friendships meant a lot. Yeah, to RC. Very meaningful to him. Yeah. Something that's exploded in recent years, and maybe RC wouldn't have had as much visibility of this when he was with us, is with the explosion of the internet, things like the prosperity gospel and mm -hmm. Christian TV, and just how prominent that is as the, Christ, you know, the public face of Christianity in many parts today. What do you think RC would have made of that? Oh, he talked about it often. He would hear these prosperity gospel preachers and he said, listen, if you want to study in, in heresy, if you want a, a study of heresy throughout church history, all you have to do is turn on Christian television between the hours of 10 p.m. and 4 a.m. <laughs> or all you have to do is go out onto the internet and within the course of a couple hours, you will hear every single heresy that has ever been put forth in church history. One of the things that bothered R.C. the most was bad theology and the way bad theology could just ricochet through the church yeah. and just be horrific in its consequences for the people of God. So he was very concerned to counter all of this bad theology with good theology. You know, at the end of his life, I think one of the things that R.C. loved the most was just the way Ligonier was having a global reach 
the, the stories he would hear of the, the success of the church in Asia and in Africa and in South America below the equator. He just loved to hear about how there's potentially a new reformation taking place in some of these places. So yeah, he was very tuned in yeah. to what was happening, very concerned about what was happening and wanted to use all these resources to counterpunch this yeah. uh, with uh, orthodox uh, yeah. theology. Yeah. You wrote this brilliant book from a position of already knowing RC really well. I'm really interested. What, what surprised you in the process of writing it that, you, you know, through your research, what stories surprised yeah. you or did you enjoy the most? I think one of the things I enjoyed the most was just digging into the early years. You know, we, we know RC through his teaching series and his platform ministry and his books from the mid 80s, 90s, zeros. Some people are even discovering RC for the first time after his death. I was interested in that time of his conversion, 1957, to the early years of the study center, 1970, you know, a good dozen years there of that foundation. And, you know, you, you knew it. He would stand up and teach without notes, but you knew there was preparation behind yeah. that. And to go back in, I, I had access to his library and his books with all his margin notes. I had access to his personal notebooks where he would just write out page after page of notes on topics. And I, you could see him, there he is with his feet under the desk, his open Bible, his open book, his open notebook, pen in hand, just building that foundation. Mm -hmm. And I just love to see that. And how God then blessed that with this edifice of a ministry that was built on top of that foundation. I would say, you know, let that be an encouragement to, to you out there that are listening to this, to, to just be faithful in building that foundation and shoring up, you know, your knowledge of God, because God will use that and will use that to have a ministry impact on other people. We're not all RC Sproles with a global platform, uh, but we have spheres of influence. Yeah. And um, as we invest in building in that foundation, then we'll see God bless in our lives. So it was, it was just fun to see that foundation and um, see sort of RC's sweat and labor yeah. Yeah. Uh, in those early years. Yeah. One of the stories that I've enjoyed you um, talking about, I'd love you to share it right now, is the playful side of him that a lot of people wouldn't have seen yes. so much. When you was involved with the ground open breaking <laughs> and you, with yes. your body shoes. Tell us about that, Stephen. So uh, I, I love his playfulness. And the thing about RC is not only could he tease, but he also enjoyed being teased. So not everybody, you know, likes, it's not always a two way street, yeah. right? Yeah. But this one in particular was our dedication for a new building here. This was uh, spring of 2017. And we got RC uh, uh, construction helmet. You know, of course, it was a Steelers, Pittsburgh Steelers construction yeah. helmet. And uh, I had cut out a piece of the sod and, and told RC that when we get out there, I'll use my foot. I'll sort of point to it. And he had the golden shovel, of course. And so he, he digs up the piece of sod. Well, now he's got the sod on and the shovel. And I'm standing next to him. And I'm in my black suit with my shiny black dress shoes. And RC looks at me, <laughs> looks at the shovel, looks at my shoes, has a little wink in his eye, and of course, tosses the, just sort of flicks the sod piece, lands right in front of my shoes, and a little bit of dirt and sand just, you know, sprinkles up onto my dress shoes. And um, that that's the side of RC we just loved. Yeah. Uh, he just was playful and full of life. Yeah, brilliant. You mentioned earlier on um, his relationship and his involvement with things and, and his obviously his opinions with things like Catholics together. What else were some of the more controversial things that RC got involved with? That was a significant one. So we're back to 1994. This is the document Evangelicals and Catholics together. On the evangelical side, a significant architect of it was his close friend, Chuck Colson. They were friends since the mid to late 70s. And they were on each other's boards. Um, and they would frequently vacation together, the Sprouls and the Colsons. And out comes this document, Evangelicals and Catholics Together. Yeah. And it was also signed by another very close friend of RC's, J.I. Packer. They go back to 1973. 
But RC was on the other side of that document and felt like there was a significant issue here that the doctrine of justification and specifically the doctrine of imputation was set aside in this discussion of evangelicals and Catholics and being able to come together. RC thought this doctrine was essential to the gospel and therefore essential to evangelical identity. Siding with him was John MacArthur and also D. James Kennedy and uh, also a young Mike Horton. And of course, on the other side was Packer and Chuck Colson and also um, not as uh, close as friend to his, but a friend of his, Bill Bright with Campus Crusade. And so uh, this was a tough moment in R.C.'s life. He, he talked about it often. Vesta spoke of it as the hardest moment in R.C.'s life. Mm -hmm. And it grieved him, uh, this difference in this controversy. But he believed and he really sought to bring clarity to issues of significance that impacted the church. And, and that's what he wanted to do there. He didn't want to go in there to just stir up the pot and create controversy and make things difficult and be sort of a conflictual individual. Yeah. Uh, but, it, but it did cause conflict and it did cause a rift in friendships that mattered to him. And uh, that, that was a hard moment for yeah. RC, no doubt. Yeah. How did RC deal with his fame? <laughs> so there's, this is what I love about RC. He loved people. And uh, didn't matter uh, who you were. He was not a respecter of persons. I, I think, and I saw this. I, I saw this in the way, you know, I, I remember being with him at one event and there was a billionaire uh, that was at that event. And the billionaire just really wanted to meet RC and looked forward to it and, you know, made the arrangement and he meets RC. But it, it just, it was not a, you know, he spent time, he was gracious, he was kind, and photograph is taken, hands are shaken, or maybe we we're doing fist bumps then, and, and you know, it was, our seat was very respectful and kind. Um, then, you know, we're leaving that room, and we're headed out uh, to the venue, and here's a family with a kid. And the kid wants to meet RC and just wants to tell RC, thank you for one of RC's children's books. And what does RC do? He stops, he, he greets the kid, he gives him a big smile. He says, what's your name? He takes a photograph and then he goes on. And I thought, you know, that, that's, that's what it is. Um, he just respected people and appreciated people and cared about people. And um, I, don't, I don't think he let all these things um, get to his head or let them um, dissuade him or distract him. Yeah. What influence has R.C. Spohr had on your life personally? Oh, it's an example of faithfulness. Um, you know, just faithfulness, theological fidelity, mission fidelity, uh, life integrity fidelity. Uh, his boldness and, and courage and conviction. You know, this is what R.C. loved about the Reformers. It, it wasn't just their message. It was the boldness with which they proclaimed the message. Uh, I, I think what we were just talking about, uh, he had an abiding sense of respect for people and a sense of their dignity. And uh, I, I would love for that to also be a, a mark for me. Um, but I, I think in the end, uh, the, the thing I loved about RC was the focus on things that matter um, and just that, that singular purpose of focusing on things that matter. You know, he would often uh, express the idea that the most timely is the timeless. Mm -hmm. And it's really easy to get sort of caught up in chasing after a headline or chasing after this when really it just comes down to that over the plate uh, theology, yeah. just the, those basics of, of being a faithful teacher and uh, serving the church through faithful teaching. So uh, that's probably the, the standout uh, that I would hope to emulate uh, and that I learned from R.C., he wrote so many amazing books. What's your favorite? 
Oh, well, I have to say Holiness of God, right? Because I do think that's going to be the classic book. Uh, I love, so I'm, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to say a couple here. Uh, I actually like his book, Enjoying God, uh, which is a book about God's attributes that I think not everybody is as is, is connected to or knows about. I just love it. I love the title, Enjoying God. It's the catechism, right? Um, I also love uh, his two books, Defending Your Faith and Consequences of Ideas, because I like apologetics and I teach that field. And uh, I find those books really helpful. And then I'm going to have to say his first book, The Symbol. It was published in 1973. Um, it's on the Apostles' Creed. It's available today, but I'm blanking on the title uh, that, that it is um, known as uh, today. But it's got all the sort of energy yeah. of a first-time writer. Uh, it, it, it's got RC just in a genuine sense coming across the pages. And I just love the personality that oozes uh, onto the pages yeah. of the symbol. Well, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Nichols, and taking the time to talk to us today about this book. Thank you for writing the book and opening so many memories for us that we wouldn't have known about without you doing so. Do you have any closing thoughts? And Also, let people know how they can follow your journey going forward. Sure. Uh, I'm, I'm here at Ligonier. You can catch us at Ligonier.org and also serve at the College RC founded Reformation Bible College. So you can catch us at ReformationBibleCollege.org. I think the thought going forward is how uh, I, twofold. Number one, uh, RC was not about RC. Uh, RC was about the teaching. He was about God. He, he didn't want people to know who he was. He wanted people to know who God was. And so let's remember that, right? Our lives are, are reflectors of the glory of God. And, and may all of our lives just point people beyond ourselves to who God is. But secondly, and I, I think this is it, never underestimate the impact that you can have on other people. Think about these two guys back in college that were just having a Bible study and, and just happened to summon someone over to the, the table to say, hey, look at this passage in God's word. They didn't need formal theological training to do that. All they needed was an open Bible <laughs> and a little bit of courage. Um, and what an impact that moment had for literally tens of thousands of people. Never underestimate uh, the impact that you can have uh, for God and for the kingdom just by reaching out to people and just by pointing them uh, to God's word. Yeah, amazing. Well, we're gonna make sure that we've got the link to your book in the description below. Thanks again for your time, really enjoyed it. Oh, my pleasure. This has been so fun and thanks for your ministry and may God bless as you carry on. <laughs>